having uh, said that I was going to give a paper uh, on Did God Survive the Somme, I feel I should prob probably provide an answer to that question. So uh, the answer to that question is, uh, did uh, God die on the Somme? No. Uh, uh, that, that's the paper I was originally planning to give. And I started thinking as I... Uh, found myself staring down the barrel of the gun of not having time to do any real primary research for this paper. But um, it actually wasn't a very interesting question. Um, so very, very briefly, I will run you through some of the standard points about uh, the impact of the First World War on religion. Um, there is now, I think, a substantial body of opinion uh, that uh, stresses elements of religious continuity in belief rather than profound change. Um, we can see in the English case uh, a religious structure that adapts surprisingly well in many respects to war. Uh, we can look at the success, for example, on the Western Front um, of the institution of Talbot House, uh, which uh, acts as a... Um, Anglican sort of rest and recreation centre for soldiers in the Ypres salient. Uh, we can point to the chaplaincy of um, Stubbett Kennedy, uh, Woodbine Willie, um, and the degree to which he is able to um, work uh, with uh, the soldiers. Um, Woodbine Willie himself and Stubbett Kennedy. Um, certainly finds the war very challenging to his face, but he is able to adapt, particularly with a, a certain form of Christ-centred theology. The Army and Religion Survey of 1917 um, famously suggests uh, great weaknesses in the religiosity of uh, British soldiers from a particular Anglican and indeed, uh, I would argue, Eucharistically centred Anglo-Catholic perspective. Um, but what it largely measures in, is in many ways um, the weaknesses in their formal religious understanding which owe a great deal uh, to their pre-war situations rather than anything that particularly <coughs> happens to them um, on the front line. Uh, we can point also to something like uh, the success um, of Dick Shepherd's ministry at St Martin's in the field where he throws open the church to soldiers on leave and has packed congregations pretty much throughout uh, the First World War. Um, that is not to say, and Jessica probably will know this a lot better than me, that individual soldiers don't lose faith. They do. Um, but other individual soldiers find faith in the trenches. Um, and I'm not sure that there's any meaningful generalisation that you can make given this two-way traffic. Um, in the German case, um, Benjamin Zeman suggests in the case of specifically of um, Bavarian Catholic soldiers um, in 1916 that the pressures of material schlacht um, do damage men's belief in a sort of functional <laughs> religion. After all, when you see men praying uh, and then killed almost the next instant, if you are actually thinking in terms of the magical efficacy of religious practice, that can be quite damaging. Um, on the other hand, of course, Annette Becker, um, looking at, of course, the other participants in the Battle of the Somme, the French, um, suggests that um, during 1916 and 17, there's quite an increase um, in uh, resort to various forms of um, instrumental and functional <coughs> religious practice. Uh, for example, faith in uh, the efficacy of religious medallions or um, little uh, prayers to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. So, if we are asking the question about the role of the First World War in promoting the secularisation of society, either in Britain or in Europe, I'm not sure that we are able to very effectively get at anything that looks like a conclusive answer, particularly when trying to separate out the war from the much longer term trends um, in changes in religious practice. Now, um, I'm not going to get bogged down in the general theories of secularisation at this point, uh, many of which have I either find personally problematic or have been certainly very heavily problematised by historians in the last 30 years. Um, 
But it's not immediately apparent that the experience of war, even the experience of mass industrialized war, necessarily drives things in any one direction. Just as a little sidebar, um, I had a quick look on uh, the uh, function that allows you to search the corpus of various languages on Google <laughs> Books in terms of uh, the frequency of words. And um, if we look at uh, the word God um, in either the US or in the British corpus, if we look at the word Dieu in French, if we look at the word Gott in German or the word Dieu in Italian, it's actually striking that the war doesn't seem to have any impact um, of any significant kind on the frequency of the use of these words. Now, granted, it's a crude tool. We don't know what the contexts are. It could be that every use of the word Gott in Germany after 1919 is talking about how it's a stupid idea. Um, but nonetheless, it's striking that there is actually a fairly steady state in terms of um, the sheer usage um, of the words for the deity. Um, before I uh, started out on this, my wife actually asked me, so what about the history of atheism? Um, does the war play any particularly significant role there? Um, well, um, it does see the establishment um, of a uh, state-sanctioned atheism, obviously, um, in the Soviet Union, and briefly in one or two other countries as well, although um, uh, their communist revolutions fail. Um, but beyond that, in terms of the intellectual history of atheism, remarkably little, uh, certainly compared with the Holocaust and the Second World War, uh, which are used much more widely as evidence that you know, God cannot possibly exist. Um, in fact, it's striking uh, that in a text that has become very popular amongst the new atheists, uh, the Dawkins and, and, the, and the late Christopher Hitchens, uh, Bertrand Russell's Why I'm Not a Christian, which is published in 1927, uh, the war is conspicuously absent as an argument against Christianity, uh, which, considering Russell's own war record, I think is quite striking. But he doesn't say, you know, this proves uh, the non-existence of God or make any hint of that kind. Um, apart from possibly you could read some of his comments about whether or not you know, religion actually improves morality as bearing on this. But it, it certainly is very tangential if it's there at all. So this was a very long way of saying I've abandoned... Uh, the original project of this paper, um, partly because I thought that the uh, uh, payoff of um, engaging in a great deal of um, uh, search sourcing was uh, not actually going to turn out to be intellectually uh, commensurate in terms of the payoff. And so what I'm going to do instead is uh, take very seriously uh, the title of this seminar and uh, address the religious legacy of the First World War. Um, this is going to involve six subjects, on none of which can I claim any particular strong expertise, which could make uh, the discussion session after this paper uh, particularly traumatic for me and possibly interesting, uh, because in some cases it's likely, to, likely that there will be people in the audience who know a good deal more about these subjects uh, than I do. So, uh, the first legacy I wish to address um, is the death of Christendom. Um, and this is how um, the Professor of Divinity and um, Doyen of Religious Historians, uh, Dermot McCulloch, uh, describes 1914-1918 um, in his uh, History of Christianity. What he is referring to uh, in this, is the collapse of church establishment as a fundamental principle dating back uh, to the era of Constantine the Great. Church establishment, it is worth remembering, was still the norm in the Europe of 1914, even if it had been tempered by a growing toleration of uh, other largely Christian uh, religious groupings. Um, an unambiguous separation of church and state characterised only the French Republic, Ireland within the United Kingdom since the disestablishment of the Church of Ireland, and very, very recently at the point of the outbreak of the war, the Portuguese Republic, uh, where church and state are separated in 1910. 
This is the situation before the war. The situation after the war is very different. The war profoundly disrupts the relationship between church and state more or less everywhere. Um, in wartime Greece, this is spectacularly dramatised uh, by the Archbishop of Athens uh, burning the Greek Prime Minister Venizelos in effigy whilst pronouncing a solemn anathema um, on uh, him for uh, his uh, activities. That's a rather extreme case, but of course in terms of the big uh, and profound case, the biggest single separation of this relationship is that which occurs in Russia. Uh, the 900-year relationship between the monarchy and the Orthodox Church in Russia ended in February, brackets Julian, February 1917, and leads to a brief and exciting experiment uh, with church independence, uh, the calling of the All-Russia Church Council and the attempt to create a Russian Orthodox Church which is not bound in the way that the Russian Orthodox Church had been at least um, as far back as the 17th century to dependence on, on the Tsarish regime. Um, this uh, experiment uh, was brought to a halt uh, by the establishment of an explicitly anti-religious <coughs> regime from October, again, brackets Julian calendar of that year. Um, the result um, was, of course, that Russian Orthodoxy would experience the 20th century as an uncomfortable mixture of martyrdom, indeed, perhaps more Christian martyrs, predominantly though not exclusively Orthodox, were created in 20th century Russia than everywhere else in history combined, and at the same time, intermittently, um, periods of collaboration between the Orthodox Church in Russia um, and the communist regime, uh, leaving itself uh, a series of very uncomfortable legacies. This experience, I think, is still haunting um, the Russian Orthodox world. And if we look at the contemporary religious scene, um, obviously, the events of 1991, in a sense, reset the clock at 1917. But in some ways, what is going on at the moment um, is an uneasy um, uh, attempt to see whether, in fact, the clock needs to be set back even beyond February 1917 to once again establishing an intimate and effectively established relationship uh, between Russian Orthodoxy and Putin's uh, undemocratic state. And, of course, the Pussy Riot event uh, in the Cathedral of the Saviour um, are uh, a very vivid uh, <coughs> illustration of this, where uh, the state prosecutes um, people for hooliganism, where, of course, the, the church is, in effect, turning over what they see as a responsibility for prosecuting them for blasphemy. But it's not blasphemy, technically, because it's not an established uh, church in that way. In Germany, uh, the evangelical church... Uh, lost its position of primacy uh, as a result of the overthrow of the monarchy. Um, Kaiser Wilhelm had been uh, the first bishop of the evangelical church, um, a role that I think is somewhat more operational in some respects than the role of the Supreme Governor of the Church of England. Um, but um, with the German Revolution, the new Republican government uh, incorporated um, social democrats who came from explicitly anti-clerical backgrounds and indeed one of these is appointed for the oversight of church affairs. Um, the, uh, the new Weimar government um, removes uh, some of the responsibilities for obligatory church membership. As a result, large numbers of people resign from church membership um, in the immediate aftermath of the revolution. As a result of this, um, German Protestants move for the first time really since Luther into a position of opposition to the established state. Uh, I think the survey suggests that something in the order of two-thirds of evangelical clergy are actively expressing views hostile to the Weimar Republic by the early 1920s. And this was something that I think would have very long-term consequences for German history. Although the majority of Protestant laity and clergy would demonstrate loyalty to the Nazi regime when it comes to power in 1933, 
uh, infamously. A minority would not. And the confessing church, of course, became one of the important focal points of resistance uh, to uh, Hitler's uh, regime. It is a little observed point, but one which probably needs to be emphasised most often, that for those in the confessing church the, ha the church, the habit of disobedience actually often carries on from uh, Weimar. Um, for example, uh, Martin Niemöller, um, a co-founder of the Confessing Church, had been an active Freikorps volunteer um, in 1919. Furthermore, I think we can trace this thread of um, uh, opposition to the state on into the post-1945 period, uh, where the evangelical church becomes a major focus of resistance uh, to the GDR, uh, to the East German dictatorship, often in, in many ways carrying through, again, the logic of the Confessing Church uh, in its opposition to Hitler, and of course plays a significant role in the events of 1989 in Germany. The Habsburg Empire had had a quasi-established relationship with the Roman Catholic Church, um, and the Habsburgs had been a principal bulwark of Catholicism for centuries. In the era of the Holy Roman Empire, the dynasty had frequently been at odds with the papacy, but in the 19th century it had re-emerged as an important supporter in the face of the challenges of French anti-clericalism and later the new Italian state uh, dominated by a Piedmontese aristocracy hostile to Rome. Um, so in many respects by 1914, uh, and this I will come back to in a moment as well, um, the relationship between the prisoner of the Vatican, as the Pope is then, um, and uh, the Habsburg Emperor has become particularly strong. In many respects, the Habsburg Empire is the last Catholic great power standing. Um, furthermore, it's also worth noting that you know, all of those maps which demonstrate the impossibility of the Habsburg Empire due to its massive ethnic diversity mm. tend to overlook the fact that the Habsburg Empire is actually quite striking its religious uniformity. Um, it's more than 70% Roman Catholic. And if you add in the Greek Catholics um, uh, in, in Ruthenia, uh, the, broadly speaking, the Catholic uh, 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 group uh, increases further still. It is therefore perhaps fitting that the very last Habsburg Emperor, the Emperor Karl, uh, was one of the most personally devout uh, leaders of the dual empire in its history, and indeed is one of the few monarchs of the post-Tridentine era uh, to have been beatified uh, in 2004, and is still seriously being considered for sainthood. Um, and indeed, actually, I discovered online there's a wonderful uh, website dedicated to the cause of the, of, of the, uh, of, of the sanctification of the Emperor Karl. Uh, the use of poison gas uh, by the uh, Austrian army is a bit of a wrinkle uh, in that particular <laughs> case. But, uh, um, as uh, Dermot McCulloch points out, only one major uh, established church made it through the war essentially unscathed, and that was the Church of England. But even there, it could be argued that the life and liberty movement, um, particularly uh, developed um, uh, by a rising Anglican star, the young uh, William Temple, uh, mounted a significant challenge from within the church to some of the, uh, of, of, of the uh, assumptions of establishment. And indeed, actually, the relationship between church and state does become increasingly problematic uh, during the 20s and 30s, particularly uh, manifesting itself in the prayer book controversy. So that's the first one, uh, the uh, change in this uh, relationship between church and state through many areas of Europe. Um, the second topic uh, I'd like to suggest as a legacy of the war um, is that of uh, the Virgin of Fatima and the modern papacy. The decision of the current Pope uh, to adopt the name Benedict the Sixteenth was a clear and deliberate tribute, and he says so very openly, to the wartime role of Benedict the Fifteenth. As the war progressed, um, Pope Benedict the Fifteenth, who had um, initially been perceived as line, leaning slightly towards uh, the Entente powers, he's perceived before 1914 as somewhat francophile, uh, and indeed it is actually the French cardinals who act as the decisive uh, group who vote for him. Uh, when he's elected at the start of the war, um, uh, the Pope becomes um, increasingly outspoken uh, in his calls for 
uh, a, a negotiated peace uh, culminating in the Papal Peace Note of August 1917, um, a note which manages to uh, unite almost the whole world, um, it appears sometimes in hostility uh, to the papacy, uh, ranging from uh, the German High Command uh, to the American Secretary of State Robert Lansing uh, to uh, the Archbishop of Paris. Um, <coughs> in this context of papal peace initiatives, <coughs> there come in the course of the year 1917 a series of Marian visions to three young Portuguese children, uh, Lucia dos Santos um, and her two young cousins, uh, Yacinta and Francisco, um, who um, from May to October 1917 um, have a series of visions of the Virgin and a series of conversations which become uh, collectively known as the Revelations of Fatima. These visions need to be seen as occurring uh, at the conjunction of a series of different things. The first is that the war in Portugal is very unpopular. Um, uh, it's seen by most Portuguese as really none of their business, a uh, series of impositions, it's causing, financial, causing economic difficulties, um, and conscription is extremely unpopular, and it is being blamed specifically on the anti-clerical Portuguese Republican government. By early 1917, it's becoming increasingly clear, partly through um, a series of uh, messages that come out to the clergy, that the Pope is um, a, himself an anti-war figure. Thirdly, Benedict XV um, is himself um, deeply committed I'm not sure quite exactly if this is the right word, a deeply committed Mariologist, um, and uh, is linking by early 1917 uh, worship of the Blessed Virgin Mary with the search for, for peace. And in particular, and I think this is significant for the context um, of Fatima, on the 5th of May 1917, he adds the invocation, Queen of Peace, pray for us, to the widely used Marian Litany of Loretto, as it's called. Uh, this is one week before the first Fatima apparition. Finally, um, and this again is relevant to uh, the uh, Fatima um, uh, events, um, the February Revolution in Russia has begun by the spring to have filtered out in terms of global consciousness. Uh, and again, given that some of the things that the uh, Blessed Virgin says uh, to Lucia de Santos, refer specifically to Russia. Um, this is uh, significant. So I won't go into the details of uh, uh, what happens at Fatima. Uh, the children at some point, and there's a lot of argument about exactly what happens. They are sort of confined at the behest of an apparently Masonic anti-clerical mayor of the village. Then they're released. There's a, the final apparition occurs in October <coughs> 1917. It's the famous uh, case where Allegedly, a crowd of 80,000 see the sun dance in the sky. Um, the church is not entirely sure how to respond to this, any more, in fact, than the, the, than the Roman Catholic Church is entirely sure how to respond to the slightly earlier um, set of visions of uh, um, a young French girl, Claire Fachot, who claims uh, that uh, the French that, that she's being called upon to dedicate uh, the French Republic to the bleeding heart, uh, to, the, to the Sacred Heart of Jesus? Um, it isn't, in fact, until 1930 um, that uh, the authorities in the Vatican declare uh, the visions of uh, the, the visions and revelations of Fatima as officially worthy of belief. Um, the two younger of the children who originally see the vi visions, uh, Jacinta and Francisco, die in the Spanish flu epidemic. Um, but um, Lucio dos Santos actually lives to 2005. Um, and actually, although she becomes a nun, I, I think it continues to actively promote uh, the Fatima visions. Now, the key legacy um, of the visions of Fatima come through two 20th century popes. The first of these um, is Pius XII. Uh, 
as Bishop Pacelli, he is ordained as Cardinal Archbishop on the 13th of May 1917, which is the date of the first Fatima apparition. Um, and once he comes to know of this, it seems to affect him very, very greatly. Um, he is a true believer in uh, the events at Fatima. Um, and they play a quite a powerful role in setting the particular Marian tone um, of Pius XII's papacy. Um, he doesn't um, fully obey the alleged command uh, to dedicate uh, Russia to the Blessed Virgin Mary um, until uh, 1952, uh, when he promulgates the uh, Sacra Vahente, uh, which consecrates Russia to the Virgin, although he comes close to doing it in, in 1942, when he sort of more ambiguously um, uh, dedicates the entire world to the Virgin, including Russia. Uh, but this is not seen as properly fulfilling the command. But I think there's no doubt, and again, in 1954, um, partly coming out of this um, uh, uh, Fatima tradition, uh, he declares um, a, um, uh, a Marian year. Um, uh, he also, um, uh, in um, 1950, um, puts forward as an ex cathedra statement of dogma um, that the Virgin Mary um, had been bodily um, assumed. Um, this is actually the only full um, ex cathedra papal dogmatic statement um, since uh, the first of, of these in, in the modern era in 1870. Um, again, to do with Mary. Um, Paul VI, um, uh, in 1967, um, uh, visits uh, the shrine at Fatima. And, of course, John Paul II, um, who had been himself consecrated by Pius XII um, towards the end of his papacy, um, was a major believer um, in the Virgin of Fatima and credited, it was, it's credited the Virgin with saving his life um, after the failed assassination attempt of, 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 of 19, um, uh, 1981. Um, the current Pope, Cardinal Ratzinger, was co-author of the publication of The Third Secret of Fatima in 2000, uh, stating uh, that uh, the, the revelations of Fatima had at that point been fully fulfilled. Um, and in the same year, uh, John Paul II uh, beatified uh, Jacinto and Francisco. Um, Benedict XVI, the current Pope, actually has been rather ambiguous about Fatima, although he does now seem to be moving back uh, towards a much stronger um, uh, endorsement of the Fatima position. And indeed, in 2010, rather indicated in the sermon that he gave uh, at Fatima, uh, that one of the revelations, revelations of Fatima about problems within the church was referring specifically uh, to the child abuse scandals. Um, so again, he seems to be now indicating a, a greater degree of um, uh, conviction in this. So what does any of this matter? Apart from the fact that it has actually been a, a very large element within 20th century Catholicism. Um, well, I think um, the Fatima piety has two significant implications in 20th century Roman Catholicism. One of them um, is that by um, its um, indication that Russia would be gathered in specifically to the bosom of the Roman Catholic Church, um, it has two political um, effects. One of them is that it operates against tendencies towards ecumenicism um, and in favour of a more traditional and intran intransigent idea of reunion on Rome's terms. And secondly, for a long period, and at its height, I think, in the 1950s, um, it can become a rallying position for a specifically anti-communist focus for the papacy. And this is particularly important, I think, for Pope John Paul II. And... Um, Furthermore, I think there is a, an in interesting um, linkage, although I'm not quite sure I've been able to work it out specifically, between um, the degree to which both Pius XII um, and John Paul II have been very much believers in centralisation, a kind of papal monarchy vision of Roman Catholicism. And it is striking that the one pope 
um, of uh, the modern era who has had absolutely no, who had absolutely no interest really in Fatima was John the Twenty Third. Uh, indeed, in 1960, um, which is the year when the third secret of Fatima is first supposed to be revealed, he reads it and kind of goes. <laughs> and, and puts it back in the drawer. Um, so again, uh, John the Twenty Third, uh, the instigator of the Vatican Council, is not uh, a, a huge Fatima fan. Okay, um, number three. Uh, I think I'm going to manage it. Um, uh, third religious impact um, of uh, the First World War. Uh, modern Islamicist thinking uh, and the jihad. Um, now, famously um, on, on, I think probably famously now, uh, wasn't necessarily much thought of ten years ago, uh, on the 13th of November um, 1914, um, there is the promulgation of a fatwa um, in Constantinople signed by 20 religious authorities, um, stating uh, that uh, it is a that there will be a, 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 a jihad, um, a uh, religious war um, against Britain, France, Russia, and all of their allies. Uh, that um, salvation for um, Muslim soldiers who fight against these powers um, will be uh, guaranteed, and also that damnation will follow for Muslim soldiers who fight on behalf of these powers. Now, recent research, in particular quite a recent article in, in War and History, has played down the unprecedented nature of this declaration um, and has indicated that you can sort of see an evolving tendency um, in late Ottoman uh, rhetoric towards this idea. Nonetheless, it should be said that this, this particular declaration of jihad is really quite um, extraordinary. Um, it isn't, uh, again, as I think this article indicates, uh, simply at the behest of the Germans. They haven't been manipulated into this. It does make sense within its own Ottoman context. Um, uh, but it is something um, you know, quite new in some ways. Um, one can also question the effectiveness of, of, of this declaration. There were some Muslim uprisings uh, in North Africa. Um, but these um, tended uh, to have uh, their roots in local struggles against colonial rule. Uh, for example, the Libyan Sanusi uh, rebellion against the Italians predates uh, the war and the declaration of jihad, and indeed certainly predates it issues entry into the war, um, and tends then to spill over um, into conflicts against the French um, and uh, the British uh, on either side of Libya. Uh, again, some of the um, uh, religious war that's going on is actually more or less exactly that sort of Algeria, Mali borderland, which is uh, currently uh, so much in the news. Um, the Singapore mutiny um, of one um, uh, uh, regiment of uh, the British Indian Army does seem to have linkages um, with uh, this Ottoman declaration, uh, but it's an isolated case of um, religious resistance. Um, in the British Indian Army, which uh, is very largely um, uh, consisting of Muslim troops. Likewise, on the whole, um, the uh, French Western North African forces uh, that are recruited from Muslims remain entirely loyal. So the Declaration of Jihad in and of itself, I'm not sure necessarily does create um, a long-term legacy of the First World War within Islam. But the war does, I think... Um, and I would want to point um, to four aspects uh, that become important. The first of these um, is uh, Muslim loss of control over the third holy place of Islam, uh, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Um, fairly quickly, this does take on symbolic importance uh, in the Middle East and even beyond as a humiliation for Muslims. And one could also, um, to some extent, associate with this um, increasing concern and discontent about the implications of the Balfour Declaration, even though, of course, the Balfour Declaration um, states quite explicitly um, uh, that the rights of existing populations uh, are not to be infringed. Um, the second 
um, is the formal end of the Islamic Caliphate um, by the new Turkish Republic in uh, the early 1920s. This, of course, is an action that occurs um, within um, the Muslim world. Uh, the decision of Mustafa Kemal uh, to abolish this particular um, juridical uh, responsibility and to move Turkey uh, you know, on, onto a secular republican model um, is not something that has been imposed by outsiders, although it is widely misinterpreted in almost exactly that light through much of the Muslim world. Um, and again, even to this day, um, there are indications, I mean, if you look at certain sort of jihadist rhetoric, you know, strong um, attempts to suggest that Mustafa Kemal, uh, Kemal Ataturk uh, was not actually Muslim at all. Uh, he was a crypto Jew or something of, that, of this sort. Um, in particular, um, the end of the caliphate um, uh, motivates the Muslim thinker Rashid Rida um, to formulate a clear vision of a future caliphate which will be based around the idea of Sharia law. And this is, I think, recognisably a start point for much of modern Salafist thinking. <coughs> Now, independently of this, but related to it, are the consequences of the power vacuum that develops in the Arabian Peninsula um, as a result of Ottoman defeat. In 1915, uh, the British had signed the Treaty of Darin with Ibn Saud, who at that point is engaged in a power struggle with the Al Rashid family um, in the area of Riyadh, um, and the Al Rashid family are supported by the Ottomans. So the British are early backers of the Saudis. Uh, and the Saudis, of course, themselves are in alliance um, uh, with Wahhabi Sunni Muslim Puritans. Um, in 1916, perhaps much more famously, uh, the British signed a separate agreement um, with the Hashemite uh, family, who are the hereditary guardians of the Muslim holy places <laughs> of Mecca and Medina. This is, of course, the origins of uh, the, you know, the revolt in the desert, the Arab revolt. Now, that revolt draws um, Hashemite resources away from uh, the Arabian Peninsula and into Palestine, Syria, um, uh, Iraq. Um, and, of course, we know um, that uh, there's a failed attempt by um, uh, Hussein um, to take control of Syria. That's thwarted by the French and the British agreement with the French. Um, but, of course, it does see the establishment of Hashemite monarchies um, in Iraq uh, and in Transjordan. But the result of this is that they rather neglect their own original power base around Mecca and Medina, which allows the Saudis, once they triumph in 1920 over the Rashidis, to turn their attention to expelling the Hashemites and taking control of the Muslim, of the two major Muslim holy places, which they do by the middle 1920s. The consequences of that I think we are still living with. Um, uh, the Wahhabi Ibn Saud power base would be far less influential uh, in the Muslim world were it not for the prestige that they derive from their control of Mecca and Medina. And indeed, um, particularly through the institution of the annual Hajj, um, it is that that has allowed um, a particular Wahhabi strain of Islam um, to become much more influential, I think, in the Muslim world than one could imagine otherwise. Finally, um, is the collapse during the war of dhimmi relationships between non-Muslims and mon Muslims throughout much of the Middle East. Now, most infamously, um, this is uh, the uh, Armenian Genocide. But this is not exclusively the case. There are other relationships between um, uh, Christians and Muslims that also form the power in the course of the war. We tend now to forget that 100 years ago, there are significant Christian and Muslim communities throughout most of the Middle East. Um, for example, when um, uh, General Maud um, 
conquers Baghdad uh, in 1917, by some estimates, the majority of that city is Jewish. Now, the process of uh, the collapse of these uh, relationships is a long and slow one, but the war undoubtedly um, brings it to a boil. Um, now, we've got to be a little bit careful here. Um, what happens to the Armenians um, and um, also Syrian Christians, Pontic Greeks, um, a whole series of other people, and of course after the First World War, um, the Greeks of, of the Aegean coastline as well, um, is not a simple case of Muslim persecution of Christians. It is not driven by religious motivation. Indeed, a, a significant number of, 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 of Muslim jurists in the, in, in, in the Ottoman Empire speak out against this and say that this is not, in fact, correct, correct behaviour to, towards the Amin. So in, in many ways, of course, that what's driving this is, is ethnic hatred, ethnic hostility. Nonetheless, you know, the perpetrators are Muslim, uh, the victims are predominantly Christian. Um, and that on the ground is often the way that people see it. Furthermore, of course, that some Christians actually, uh, particularly Christian women, manage to actually save themselves from murder by converting, conversion to Islam. Um, now, this is slightly speculative, but I think there may be important long-term um, uh, significance because today... There are probably only two parts of the Middle East where significant Christian communities remain, one of them being Lebanon, the other one being Egypt. Um, and what this does tend to mean um, is that the long-run historical relationship in much of the Muslim world, where people of other faiths lived in the vicinity of Muslims, but in a clearly subordinate position, has largely disappeared. And this has made it easier, I think, to make the case that other religions are very much the external demonic enemy rather than your not very impressive neighbours. Um, furthermore, of course, although this is well outside of this and is not particularly a product of the First World War, the other side of this is, of course, large numbers of Muslims coming for the first time, really, in Muslim history to live in a position of relative inferiority uh, in the non-Muslim world. Um, to see themselves as living in a, in a more subordinated state. Um, there's a lot more I could say. Um, the war in Afghanistan in 1919, uh, where um, although uh, the, the, the ruler of Afghanistan is actually a rather secular figure, he deliberately takes on the pose of, of religious war um, uh, against the British. There is, of course, the, the, the Khilafat movement in, in India, um, uh, which, uh, again... Uh, is talking about um, the um, sidelining of this actually rather fictional idea of, 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 of the Muslim uh, uh, caliphate. Um, but I want to move on to point number four. Um, this is the one when I started looking at it, I, I, I hadn't really fully grasped, and it rather surprised me, which is um, the role of the First World War in the creation of American Christian fundamentalism. Now, the origins of modern fundamentalism are clearly to be found in a, in a pre-war reaction by conservative US Protestants against modernist tendency in theology. Uh, the term derives from a series of essays um, about Christian fundamentals, they are published as The Fundamentals, uh, published uh, between 1910 and 1915 uh, by theologians defending um, certain literal truths of scripture and also certain dogmatic positions um, of you know, proper Christianity. So there is something emerging before the American entry into the First World War which can be called and is starting to call itself fundamentalism. But the war plays a major galvanising role for the movement in defence of literal biblical truth, and it does so particularly through the figure of the former US Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan. Bryan, and he's on record quite frequently about this, blames the war in general on the permeation of Darwinist ideas about survival of the fittest. Um, particularly and specifically in the German High Command, and here he's drawing on an account that was published in 1917 by Vernon Kellogg, who was himself a biologist, but was also an internationalist and a pacifist. And Kellogg account, 
uh, recounts conversations with German generals which are putting forward the crudest form of uh, stereotypical social Darwinist ideas about the justification for war um, in terms of species survival and particularly national survival. Um, so Brian is, is, is looking at the German side of the war um, and blaming um, Darwinism for this. Um, but he's also um, looking at the American side um, and he rejects what can be called the mainstream Protestant embracing of the Wilsonian Crusade of 1917, particularly by the leading modernist theologians, such as Harry Van Dyke, uh, William Adam Brown, uh, and Harry Fosdick. Um, these theologians, who are the ones who are um, willing to accept uh, Darwinian uh, evolutionary theory and German modernist source criticism, tend to be the people who line up behind the progressive Wilsonian ideas um, of justified war. Now, of course, William Jennings Bryan had resigned um, from Wilson's cabinet um, in 1915 because he objected to the strength of the note that had been sent to Germany. I think it's the second or third, third Lusitania note. Uh, and feels that you know this is edging towards war. So I mean, Brian, Brian had opposed entry into the European war, and that the theologians who have supported the entry into the war um, in April 1917 are the people who um, have stood against fundamentalism. <coughs> it's not a hundred percent the case, but quite a lot of the self-proclaimed fundamentalists are isolationist anti-interventionists. Now, part of that is, of course, if you think about the geography of the United States, that you know, they, they tend to have their strongholds in the West and South. Um, they are um, men very often from the populist tradition, which, of course, William Jennings Bryan himself comes from. So there's, in a sense, you know, there may be a correlation here, which is not necessarily a causality. But there are some indications as well um, that they see this kind of secularised idealism as a distraction from fundamental... Um, Christian principles. Now, before um, the, the war in 1913, when William Jennings Bryan talks about Darwinism, he's actually just pretty, you know, pretty um, dismissive. Um, you know, it's wrong, self-evidently, it contradicts biblical truth, but he doesn't necessarily see it as a huge threat. By the end of the First World War, he <coughs> has become absolutely fired up about the dangers of modernist theology um, and um, Darwinist thought. Um, so in the immediate post-war years, I mean, Brian throws himself very, very strongly into the modernist fundamentalist controversy in his own Presbyterian church. Uh, and um, in the end, the mainstream Presbyterians reject the fundamentalist position, but there is a significant breakaway. Um, and then subsequent to this, of course, um, at uh, the request um, of the World Christian Fundamentals Association, which is a Baptist organisation which is founded in 1919, um, uh, Brian uh, takes up the role um, of um, uh, uh, prosecuting uh, at the uh, famous Scopes Monkey Trial. Uh, now, the Scopes Monkey Trial, again, um, this is um, a... Um, trial um, of a school teacher for teaching uh, the outlawed theory of evolution in a Tennessee school. Uh, the law which had outlawed the teaching of um, evolution was been quite recently passed. The Butler Act um, had been passed uh, by a prominent member of the World Christian Fundamentals Association, uh, the very people who then asked Brian to prosecute the case. Now, although in um, popular culture, perhaps shaped more than anything else by the film Inherit the Wind, uh, the Scopes trial is uh, seen as a defeat and a humiliation for Brian. This is not, as much current scholarship uh, points out, how it was seen at the time, and particularly not how it was seen at the time by fundamentalists. After all, um, Scopes is found guilty, um, uh, <laughs> and the Butler Act is upheld in this trial. Uh, and indeed, sim similar acts about the banning of evolutionary teaching are, in the immediate aftermath, it's passed in several other southern states. So, in many ways, um, the particular focus of modern American fundamentalism on biblical inerrancy um, and opposition to evolutionary teaching in particular 
is coming out of the First World War, um, or at least uh, I've been saying, and I found myself uh, checking with an American history colleague about how far uh, this was just simply a truism that everybody knew. Uh, and he said, no, it doesn't seem to be amongst American historians that widely <laughs> uh, acknowledged. Um, so, um, right, two more, and uh, so I'm going to overrun a little bit, but uh, hopefully that's, that's OK. Um, 20th century theology in general. Um, when the Kaiser um, makes his um, uh, um, announcements um, at the very start of the war, one of the voices, one of the people who is writing for the Kaiser in, in terms of these great patriotic uh, statements um, is the uh, German, the great German liberal uh, Protestant theologian, uh, Alfred von Harnack. Um, this act... Uh, has profound and significant consequences um, for 20th century theology. Um, von Harnack is one of the signatories um, of the Declaration of 93 German Intellectuals in, in August 1914, supporting uh, the German case for war. Um, and amongst those who read and are shocked um, by uh, this particular declaration is the Swiss German um, uh, pastor Karl Barth, uh, B A R T H. Um, uh, Barth sees all of these uh, German liberal um, theologians, including many of his own mentors when he'd studied theology in Germany, writing this statement in defense of Germany's war aims and says that, you know, if they are prepared to do this, why should I trust them about anything else? Um, and in Barth's own words, an entire world of theological exegesis was shaken to its foundations. In 1916, um, and just in parenthesis, um, uh, the intellectual significance of Switzerland, I think, has never been higher than in the years 1914, 1918. Anybody wants to ask about that, they can come back to, to that later on. Um, uh, but in 1916, uh, Butt uh, begins uh, an exploration, a reading of the first epistle of the Romans, uh, which he completes in 1919 and then reworks for publication in 1922. Um, and in it he launches a genuinely radical attack on the central tendencies of liberal Protestant theology um, of the years before 1914. Um, this is really operating almost on the level of epistemology. Um, uh, one of his statements is, the gospel is not a truth among other truths, rather it sets a question mark against all truths. And what Barth does, and quite shocks, and I mean Alfred von Harnack actually writes a, a, a response to this, but rather, rather shocks the, you know, the German Protestant liberal uh, theological tradition, um, is he stresses the absolute unknowability of God to man. He, uh, he challenges the entire intellectual enterprise of historical source criticism um, as it has been emerging in Germany. Now, again, you know, in fairness, it should be said in some ways he's not the first to do this. There's already been a shock to that system in the years immediately <laughs> before the First World War with Albert Schweitzer's publication of The Quest for the Historical Jesus, where he basically says that you know, that tells you a lot about the people doing it, but nothing at all about Jesus. Um, Barth takes this one degree further and actually you know, begins to insist on... Um, you know, the unknowability of God through simple detective work, if you like. Um, a somewhat different um, radical theological di direction, which also has uh, great influence on subsequent uh, 20th century Christian theology, uh, comes from the Jewish theologian Mar uh, and philosopher Martin Buber. Um, now, during the war, um, Buber had been deeply engaged with the project of liberating the Ostjuden, uh, the oppressed Jewish populations of the Russian Empire is involved in all sorts of um, German uh, and Austrian sort of quasi-propaganda activity towards the liberation of the Jews of the East. Um, but by the end of the war, something interesting is happening with Buber, which is that he's become more convinced that actually the Hasidic tradition of mysticism in these Eastern Jewish communities uh, is required to liberate the German Jews. Um, and in part, this is also to do with you know, sort of developing respect for their pacifism. Um, 
Uh, now, again, qualification. Um, Buber's engagement uh, with the Hasidim had begun well before the First World War. Uh, he publishes a set of translated um, Yiddish uh, stories, Tales from the Hasidim, which he translates into German beforehand. Um, but I think it does deepen significantly um, during the war. Um, it also is something that um, leads into a, a sort of intellectual collaboration with uh, the, the, the German veteran Franz Rosenweig, um, who, um, with um, Buber, founds a Jewish house of learning uh, and also engages in the uh, translation of the Hebrew Bible into, into German. But from the broader theological point of view, um, the key fruit of this period is the publication of Buber's work, Ich und Du, uh, which is usually translated as And I and Thou, uh, in 1923. So um, a year after uh, the final publication of Butts' uh, Epistle to the Romans. And at the centre of Buber's thought is both the contention that it is futile to speak about the nature of God, in that sense, actually rather similar to something, some of the things that Barth is saying, um, and an assertion of the centrality of God as the relation of all relations. Genuine relationships for Buber are an equal encounter between I and thou, rather than an attempt to create an objective I-it relationship in which the I defines the terms of the other's existence. By the way, I'm way out of my comfort zone here. Uh, this actually involves, I think, a kind of uh, grounding in uh, um, Kantian philosophy, which is um, one that I don't really have, uh, but I suggest what's going on. Buber's thought across the course of the 20th century um, has been almost as influential amongst Christian theologians as it has been amongst Jews. Now, again, um, there are serious incompatibilities um, between Buber's thought, particularly as it develops, and Barthes. But it could be suggested that they were both engaged in a sustained rejection of the forms of Wilhelmine religion, whether it be liberal Protestantism or the Reformed Judaism, which had closely modelled itself upon that liberal Protestantism. Indeed, both men could be seen as initiating what we would now probably call a postmodernist turn in theology, which moved away from accepting God um, as a sort of authority figure issuing commands um, in a sort of almost a celestial Kaiser um, uh, and into something that is far more difficult actually to grasp um, and indeed um, are very both men are very um, critical of the standard methods of 19th century scholarship and move towards a position which sees that quest um, for um, utilising these critical methods of, of, of understanding God not merely as futile, but even actually to some extent blasphemous. Finally, and this is the last one I promise you, uh, in terms of the uh, religious legacies of war, uh, one which um, is again uh, of the moment, uh, but one which is also, I think, very much of the future, which is the ordination of women. Um, the desire to seize the opportunity of war to promote religious revival in the Anglican Church, um, which would manifest itself as the National Mission of 1916, had the effect of highlighting the issue of women's role in church, in the church. Um, how were women to best serve the church in wartime in a context where women in various spheres were entering into roles from which they had normally been debarred? Um, and the Anglican feminist Maud Royden was particularly prominent in calling for the expansion of women's roles. Now, it's a, it's, a, it's a call that receives only a partial response, but there is a response. And in 1917, in both the United Kingdom and in Canada, a new category of female lay preacher entitled Bishop's Messengers were introduced with a specific remit of serving female congregations. So there is a break, really, with the idea that women have, have, cannot um, serve partially for the church. Now, not only does this start the path towards the discussion of women's ministry, it also very much begins uh, the coalescence of the opposition to women's ministry. Uh, indeed, the slightest discussion of women's ordination provoked the rage of Anglo-Catholics and some evangelicals, and the mouthpiece of the former, the Anglo-Catholics, the Church Times on the 20th of July in 1916 editorialised, for any sane person, the thing is so grotesque that he must refuse to discuss it. 
The monstrous regiment of women in politics would be bad enough, but a monstrous regiment of priestesses would be a thousand times worse. Uh, one still, I think, hears versions of that voice in the uh, synod to this day. Um, now, in 1919, for the first time, non-royal laywomen were allowed to participate directly in elements of Anglican governance. They were allowed to both vote and serve on parish councils and uh, to serve, both vote and serve in the General Synod of the House of Laity. And it was in turn the Sixth Lambeth Conference of the Anglican Communion in 1920 which cautiously opens what becomes the first doctrinal crack through which eventually women's ordination is possible. Uh, stating, but sometimes it becomes a duty, faithfully retaining the lessons of the sacred past, in a very special sense, to trust ourselves to his inspiration in that presence, which is our time of opportunity, in order that he may lead us to whatever, whatsoever fresh truth of thought or action is in accord with the will of God. In other words, yeah, we could change our mind on this in the future. Uh, and indeed, eventually they do. Now, after the war, Maud Royden does keep up her campaign uh, for Anglican ministry, and in 1929 she forms the Society for the Ministry of Women, which campaigns for uh, women's ministry not only in the Anglican Church, but through, through the various Protestant churches. Um, and although she never leaves uh, the Anglican Communion, um, she does become a regular preacher at the Nonconformist City Temple. Um, with the collusion of the man who many, many years later would become her husband, she does manage to preach to a mixed Anglican congregation in 1918, uh, but then she is specifically prevented by the Bishop of London from leading an Easter service in 1919. Uh, she would nevertheless actually get manage to preach on many occasions in North American Episcopal churches. Now, that's the Anglican context, but in the wider British context, the war is even more important because uh, Royden's friend, um, Constance Coltman, uh, uh, Neve Todd, uh, became in 1917 the first ordained female Christian minister in English history. Um, I actually put that in an article I wrote once and then um, uh, had a moment of panic uh, But I dis when I discovered that there, there had been an ordination in 1880, but it was a Unitarian, and they don't really count. <laughs> no, seriously, they, they're not Trinitarian Christians, so I think I can stand by the first English Christian minister on this one. Uh, there's also a, 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 um, a, a, an ambiguous Scottish case as well. Um, and certainly the process of the ordination of women um, uh, progressed faster in um, other Protestant denominations, uh, partly, of course, because they were less inhibited by the desire on the part of some of their clergy and laity to pursue reunion with Rome. Um, indeed, by 1970, one-third of the denominations represented by the World Council of Churches had ordained women, and in Britain, the Church of Scotland ordained women as deacons in 1935 and as full ministers in 1968. And the reunited Methodists did so in 1974. So um, I think we can see the war as a, as, a, as, a, as a catalyst towards the movement of ordination of women, which is a story that, as we are very aware, is still not fully played out, either in the Anglican Communion or, I would suggest, in the much wider Christian church. So six stories about the religious legacies of the, of, of the First World War. Um, and uh, on the basis of these, and I think I could have run a few others as well, I would try to make a case that the First World War could be seen um, as the most significant moment in global religious history, at least since the French Revolution, and possibly um, since the 16th century. Um, and um, we are still um, living with some of these... Um, Legacies. <coughs> now, in conclusion, um, I wouldn't claim in most of these stories that the war is the sole cause. The war acts on existing on the existing picture in many cases. Second conclusion: sometimes the crucial dimension is not the real history, but the imagined history, and I think in the case of the Islamic Caliphate, this is particularly important, the Islamic Caliphate was of no actual significance before it's abolished. It really doesn't matter. I mean, there's a certain amount of rhetoric um, in the late Ottoman period, but it's become totemic um, to modern Islamicists. 
Um, and they, 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 they go back to this horrible moment where you know, the great tradition of Sunni Islam is broken uh, by the First World War. If we think about this subject for a moment as the Great War and Religious Memory, uh, to coin a title, um, I think this set of stories can be seen as challenging and recasting two ideas about the war and modernity. Paul Spussel, of course, famously saw the war as a complete break with the past, a radical disjuncture. Uh, and in religious terms, with the implication that God and religion were amongst the things that ended up on the scrap heap um, of uh, you know, the old uh, ways. Now, by contrast, my um, uh, um, Dr. Harter, my uh, doctoral supervisor, Jay Winter, who apparently is talking tonight in Manchester, I've just discovered, um, sees the war as reinforcing traditional forms and conservative beliefs, amongst which he includes a rather vaguely defined concept of religious belief. And so for the issue of religion, I would suggest that both of them are right and both of them are wrong. The war acting with its prelude and on its sequels does indeed seem to be in many ways a strong element of disjuncture. But this is not simply disenchantment in either the way it was used by the British journalist and war veteran C. E. Montague um, in his uh, work of that title, or in the technical sense suggested by Max Weber as a, as a condition of modernity, the removal of magic from the world. Uh, and so for my final line, um, let's suggest that God didn't die on the Somme, but perhaps there was a transfiguration. Thank you. Yeah.